It's a tremendous honor to be here. Uh, I'm very happy to have been invited uh, as a guest lecturer today. And uh, I will just start to introduce myself. I will talk a little bit about health effects of electromagnetic fields. And I'm a neuroscientist and I work at the Karolinska Institute. You see me down here. And you know we are famous since we hand out the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. I have also worked at the Royal Institute of Technology, which looks like this. It's also in Stockholm. And there people are connected to the Nobel Prizes in Chemistry and Physics. Electricity has been introduced by mankind to ease our lives. Thanks to that, we can have electric light, we could run computers, and we can use electricity in our daily work. And of course, when electricity was introduced, it was only for good reasons. But very soon, first in the United States, Norway and Sweden, certain persons started to claim adverse health effects. And the idea about electrohypersensitivity was born. 1979, a very famous paper was published by Nancy Wertheimer and Ed Leeper, who had found an association between electromagnetic fields and childhood leukemia. Uh, and that was the start of a very important field which led to that the World Health Organization has cancer classified power frequent magnetic fields, which is a long word for household electricity. If we then talk about electrohypersensitivity for a few moments, uh, in Sweden and actually all over the world, in all countries that are members of the United Nations, it is classified as a functional impairment. That means it's not a disease. As doctors, you have nothing to do with it. Uh, it's for the municipalities and the special civil servants that deal with disabilities or nowadays functional impairments. And as you have noticed, I am functionally impaired. I cannot speak Spanish. And this is the United Nations definition, meaning that every person in his or her life many times will be functionally impaired. You will be when you come to Sweden if you cannot speak Swedish. And at the same time, and this happened in the year 2000, the Nordic Council of Ministers classified the symptoms as an occupationally related symptom-based diagnosis according to the ICD-10 diagnosis criteria, meaning that you can prescribe medicines for a person that has a functional impairment. When I cannot speak Spanish, I may get a headache. And then I can go to you and you give me some aspirins. So the symptoms you can deal with, but not the functional impairment. In Sweden, the persons with electrohypersensitivity have their own handicap organization which is called the Swedish Association for the Electrohypersensitive. They are also included in the very big Swedish Disability Federation, and a lot of law texts apply to them. In Sweden, the municipalities follow what is called the United Nations 22 Standard Rules on the equalization of opportunities for people with disabilities. And since 2007, it has been upgraded into the United Nations Convention 
on human rights for persons with functional impairments. And my whole lecture can actually be summarized in one sentence when we talk about electrohypersensitivity, because all people with functional impairments, such as electrohypersensitivity, are entitled to have an equal life in a society based on equality. I didn't write this. The United Nations wrote this. And they also say that one of the most important principles to achieve this is the one about complete accessibility. So people with different impairments should have accessibility to everything, regardless of what kind of impairment they have. In Sweden, impairments are viewed from the point of the environment. That means that no human being is in itself impaired, there are instead shortcomings in the environment that cause the impairment. Thus, it is the environment that should be treated, not the persons. Uh, the persons are completely normal and healthy, but they react to an inferior environment. And in Sweden, we have a lot of different law texts that regulates this, including the Human Rights Act of the European Union and the United Nations regulations. And this is a very interesting uh, action plan. And in Swedish, it says something very important. It says that they should be moved from being patients to citizens. This has a lot of implications. For instance, to force a person to quit one's employment or to move from one's home is a very serious legal violation. You are never allowed to do that. And the same goes for children. You are not allowed to discriminate them from their educational rights. Never. You must make their schools accessible. So in essence, it's actually very simple with functional impairments like electrohypersensitivity. They should just enjoy their human rights. Nothing more, nothing less. Or do you not agree? Just think for a moment, if your loved ones have electrohypersensitivity, what would you then want from your country? Or if yourself were electrohypersensitive, how would you like to be met? Okay, we will then move to some scientific studies about electrohypersensitivity. And if people, and these are from microscopes, images of the human skin, at the top you see the epidermis, the uppermost layer, and here is the rest of the human skin called the dermis. And people with electrohypersensitivity, if they are subjected to computer screens, for instance, all these cells you see here, they will move away. And the interesting thing is that this picture here is a classical radiation damage which you can get from plutonium, uranium, radium, x-rays, and strong ultraviolet light. But these have only been sitting in front of a computer screen, nothing more. Furthermore, if you look on the classical mast cells, which are the key cell for allergies and asthma and oversensitivities, People with electrohypersensitivity have a very strong activation. Again, a classical textbook image of a radiation damage. These are normal healthy volunteers, and here are people with electrohypersensitivity. And therefore, it seems as if they just have a radiation damage 
from different gadgets in our society. This activation of the mast cells combined with our knowledge around one molecule, namely histamine, can explain all the symptoms that people with electric hypersensitivity have. It, it's nothing peculiar, it's just classical textbook explanations based on mast cells and histamine. Mast cells and histamines are, of course, everyday problems for any doctor. Furthermore, if you just, oh, sorry, uh, if you just look here and there, if you take normal healthy volunteers that do not have electrohypersensitivity and put them in front of computer screens or ordinary household television sets, they don't sense anything, they don't feel anything, but the cells increase in number as if they would have gone to Fukushima in Japan, but they are still in Sweden and just watching television. And this is after two hours. Again, mast cells and their content of histamine. This points to that all people are electrohypersensitive and other scientists have shown that both 50 Hertz magnetic fields as well as 915 megahertz microwaves induce the same responses in lymphocytes from healthy and electrohypersensitive donors. So that means that the people with electrohypersensitivity, they react to an environment which we do not react to. And therefore, they seem to be a biological indicator or the classical yellow canary bird in the coal mine reacting to something that is dangerous. And we should actually be very, very happy that they have reported that something is not so good because you will soon see that there are long-term health effects that are very, very scary for the rest of the population. Other scientists have shown, and now we again are talking about the human mast cell lines, uh, that mast cells that are kept in cell culture in a small jar uh, in a culture cabinet, they don't like to use a mobile phone. They react as if there would have been an allergy in such as pollen or nickel. And I don't know for Spain, but in Sweden, the last years we have had an explosion of asthma allergies and other oversensitivities. It's just the biggest problem in the Swedish health society right now. It's huge. You see that on every slide I show the first page of the actual scientific paper and they are all from peer review based scientific journals some of them of high impact nature, so you see that I'm not sort of making the story up. It's all in here, and the citations are word by word from the actual papers here. In Japan, Hajime Kimata has shown that patients with atopic eczemas, they get worse when they are irradiated by microwaves from mobile phones. So eczema patients should definitely avoid mobile phones. In Sweden, there was various <coughs> explanations introduced to explain electrohypersensitivity. And many of them was just taken on random out of imagination. Uh, but one explanation was that 
This is actually a mass media driven psychosis. When journalists and reporters write about this, then people suddenly start to feel that, well, I am probably electro hypersensitive too. But it's very easy to control for such mass media driven psychosis uh, because you can use, for instance, rats. And rats, they do not read newspapers. They do not listen to radio. They do not watch television. And still, they react dramatically to such exposure. So, no mass media at all involved here. Some very short um, uh, descriptions here. Many people with electrohypersensitivity seems to have tinnitus, this ringing sensation in the auditory system. Again, something that has really increased dramatically in Sweden. And scientists like myself and others have shown an association between these different gadgets. I have collaborated with people in other countries, like in Japan, and in Japan, people with electrohypersensitivity have the same problems as in Spain or in Sweden or wherever. So they need our support. And also, I have collaborated with people in Finland, and we have tried to use shielding protection. And that works very well for people with electrohypersensitivity. If you take away all the electromagnetic fields, then suddenly they could function and work. And everyone is very happy with that. At the same time, I don't want to live in a society where we first buy things and then we need to go to another shop and buy protection. That is not a democracy. Uh, and therefore, already in 1997, uh, I suggested that one should reduce the public exposure. And here in Spain, you should, if we talk about mobile phone irradiation, you should take 9 million microwatts per square meter. That's the maximum exposure recommendation. But the natural background is down here. This is what your cells and molecules are accustomed to. And therefore I said, the only genuine hygienic safety value is this. And that means that we need to reduce the exposure in the order of one million billion times, 10 up to the power of 15 times. Then we are down to natural background and then it's safe. Mobile phones and mobile telephony and wireless systems in general has been a very sweet piece of candy for Sweden, Finland, United States and so on. We have Ericsson, Nokia Consumer Electronics and Motorola for instance. And we have gained an enormous income from that. Sweden is one of the richest countries in the world. We are sort of swimming in money. It's just terrible to say that, but that's the truth. Uh, there's only one country that is really rich, and that's Norway. They have more money to swim in. But, you know when you eat candy, and you eat, eat, and suddenly, ugh, not so good any longer, you know. You have eaten a little bit too much. And very early, and now it's time for you, to train your Swedish. This is a debate article. In Sweden, uh, we write in newspapers and tabloids and magazines and journals and so on. And this is from the largest tabloid, Aftonbladet, 1995. And I wrote an article saying how 
dangerous are mobile phones? This is not me. Uh, this is me, you know. <laughs> I saw all the women were looking sideways. I'm sorry for that. You know. <clears throat> and I asked a few questions. And unfortunately, they are not yet answered. I coined 1983. You were not even born then. Uh, I coined an expression that says, the largest full-scale experiment ever. What happens when we, 24 hours around the clock, wherever we are, allow ourselves and our children to be used as guinea pigs, whole body radiated for the rest of our lives? These electromagnetic signals are everywhere. They penetrate anything. And, you know, Swedes are very boring. They are dull, and they repeat themselves often. And I have repeated myself year after year after year after year after year after year after year. And now we are here. And still, very little is actually done by people in responsibility and power. And we are not. The persons that are responsible for this is always governments, and parliaments and health agencies. And they do very little. I will show a few examples where people actually have done something. 1994, in Sweden, if you really loved your family, then you should buy the Christmas gift of the year, which was this one. And maybe this was a very stupid and dangerous Christmas gift. And maybe mankind will have to pay for this. And not only mankind, all biological systems are at jeopardy. All animals, all plants, all bacteria and so on are affected by this. Probably, if we should look around on all the effects that have been published in scientific papers, and trust me, we are talking about tens of thousands of papers. There is an enormous amount of information. And probably the most dangerous effect is the DNA fragmentation. Such fragmentation shown by Henry Lai and Narendra Singh, 1996, single and double strand DNA breaks in rat brain cells after exposure to mobile <coughs> telephony. Um, such fragmentation can cause loss of fertility, impairment of the immune system, debilitation of the cancer defense, and could predict genetic damage to future generations. When Lai and Singh published their data, a number of other scientists replicated their studies and found the same results. Then the telecom industry got, and I'm sorry for the English, they got pissed. They got angry and said, no, they are wrong. There is no effect on the DNA. And Lai and Singh are just amateurs. They have not done this correctly. So the telecom industry took 100 million euros and gave to 12 laboratories in seven European countries that should replicate in a very controlled way the studies on DNA. And so they did. They worked very, very hard. And when the code, the blind code, was broken, unfortunately these laboratories had shown that Lai and Singh were right. Do you believe me when I say that the telecom industry went to bizarre measures trying to stop the publication of this study? They did everything they could to stop it, but they couldn't. It is in the public domain and it's called the reflex study. And I just show you one picture from it. When you break, destroy DNA, you get small fragments and when they move in an electrophoretic field, 
they will leave a tail of small pieces. This is DNA which is undamaged. This is DNA which has been subjected to 1,600 chest x-rays and then you see this tail and it's called the comet assay. It's like a comet on the sky with a tail. No patients in Sweden has got 1,600 chest x-rays. But this is the way it looks. And it looks the same after 24 hours of mobile phone irradiation at a so-called SAR level, specific absorption rate of 1.3 watts per kilogram. And you are supposed to withstand 2 watts per kilogram. So in your body right now, you have these. We could be dead sure about that. And finally, the same line seeing has also shown that this is a cumulative effect. The more irradiation, the more damage. And I will go back to the previous slide and just remind you of very few customers use their mobile phone only for 24 hours in their whole life. They use it every time, every day, and they also have these iPads, wireless routers, computers, etc. And they are constantly exposed. And the question is, is this safe or not? Other such effects that have been seen at very low exposure levels, uh, and I don't have time to go into all the uh, papers that are relevant here, but one such study is the leakage of the blood-brain barrier seen at 400 microwatts uh, per kilogram. And you remember, you should be able to take two kilograms per, uh, sorry, two watts per kilogram. So this is 5,000 times below what is supposed to be safe. And all of you that are doctors, you know that you do not want to have any leakage of your blood-brain barrier. But we must assume that you have. And in Sweden and in other countries, we see a lot of effects that are of brain-derived nature. Something is not okay with people's brains any longer. Maybe this is part of the explanation. And I just talked about this. You remember two watts per kilogram you should be able to take. But you see from this slide, and it's one of many, many slides, showing that below or very much below or very, very much below these two watts per kilogram, you see effects on eating and drinking behavior, calcium fluxes, DNA effects, e.g. brain wave alterations, leakage of the blood-brain barrier, and changes in cell cycle and cell proliferation. And you see, these scientists, 1997, they are 100,000 times below the safe level. And again, you don't want to have any cell cycle or cell proliferation changes in your body, definitely not. After a number of years, I felt very strongly that we as scientists had to do something more than just be in our laboratories and check test tubes and microscopic slides and that kind of things. So I said we need to get together and start writing and publishing resolutions around these questions. And you know, in science, that's very, very, very rare. That's very seldom that scientists get out into the reality. Doctors are in the reality. Scientists, they are in laboratories. But we felt we needed to get out. And in Italy, 2006, uh, in Benevento, in February, we met. We sat down and talked for several days and then we worked for many months and finally published this Benevento resolution. 
and I will not go through all of it, but you can see that among the bullet points, we said that arguments that weak electromagnetic fields cannot affect biological systems do not represent the current spectrum of scientific opinion. We also said that the precautionary principle should be implied. We said that we must inform the population of the potential risks. And we said that we must limit cell phone and cordless phone use by young children and teenagers. And also ban telecom companies from marketing to them. We must protect the children. I mean, if I would die here and now, that doesn't matter at all. I mean, you will be shocked, but that's all. But if the children are affected, then there isn't any future any longer. One thing that we also decided was that someone had to do a compilation of the scientific evidence. So put it together into some kind of report. And when you decide something, you often end up having to do it yourself. And so we did. We sat down for nine months, and it's important to remember we didn't have any resources. Not one euro, nothing. So we had to do it in our free time, in evenings, weekends, holidays, that kind of things. And after nine months, we just had to say, stop. We couldn't continue any longer. But then we had written approximately 600 pages, printed text, and we had summarized approximately 2,000 scientific references. And 2007, August 31st, it was published. And the name of it is the Bioinitiative Report. And to summarize it into one single sentence, it's actually this. We asked for biologically based public exposure standards. Before, there had only been technical standards. I will not go through the Bioinitiative report. That would take months, actually, to do it. Uh, but what happened was that the year after, September 4, 2008, the European Parliament voted 522 to 16 to recommend tightest safety standards for cell phones. And they said that the public exposure limits were completely obsolete. And they included all kinds of technologies, everything in the radio frequency field. And uh, we were, of course, very, how should you say, um, um, flattered. We were very happy, very glad, very impressed. Because how many times in your life do you write something that the European Parliament reads. And it was, after all, 600 pages. So they had been reading a lot, you know. And then they came up with this. So we were very, very happy. But then something very odd happened. Um, the telecom industry came and said, wow, this is a good idea. But Ole Johansson and his co-workers cannot do this. We should do the work to recommend new exposure standards. The telecom industry should do it instead. And they did, and they came up with that there was no need to change anything. Surprise, surprise. The problem with the Bioinitiative report was that, you remember it was published August 31st, 2007, the day after when I came to my workplace, there were already three new papers that had appeared overnight, and they should have been included in the Bioinitiative report. And since then, thousands and thousands of new papers are arriving at a very quick pace. 
and I will just quickly show you a few ones. For instance, um, scientists have shown that cell phones decrease the semen quality in men. And you see it by decreasing the sperm count, the motility, viability, and the normal morphology is changed into an abnormal morphology. As you know, in Europe, for instance, there is a catastrophe going on when it comes to male sperm fertility issues. It has been calculated that the last genetically inborn Italian will be born in about 50 to 100 years time. Then it's over for Italians. And the same goes for other European countries. In Sweden, the sperm quality has gone like this, really. It's just a dramatic effect. Other scientists have studied the effect of radiofrequent radiation and shown that mice end up in irreversible infertility. If we translate that into Spain, it could be, and I hope not, of course, but it could be that young men and women cannot get babies any longer in Spain in approximately 150 years time because of something we did today. When pregnant women, as well as newborns, are exposed to mobile phone signals, the babies in the women or just newborns, they get stressed. They get an increase in heart rate and a decrease in the cardiac output. <laughs> Their heart goes like this. And when I ask mothers and fathers if they want to have such an effect on their babies, they always say no. And still they use all these gadgets around the babies. So the babies are stressed. If that is good or bad for them, I don't know. Uh, but the parents doesn't want it to happen, but it does. This is probably one of the most famous and maybe also most important studies ever done in this field. Uh, French scientists headed by Alain Vion and his co-workers, they allowed tomato plants to be exposed to radiation from base stations. And the tomato plants, and I will quote the French scientists, they reacted as if they had been crushed with a hammer. You know, when you cut in plants, or you cut your grass or whatever you do, uh, the plants, since they are alive, will react with a damaged sequence of molecules, including a molecule called calmodulin, the tomato plants, no one touched them. They were only exposed to the base station radiation, as everyone is all day around and night around everywhere in society. And then they reacted as if they would have been crushed with a hammer. We invited this scientist to a very important meeting, but then he had been offered a new job and he didn't work any longer with this. In 2009 this was mentioned as one of the most important publications in all scientific fields all over the planet and suddenly they were not doing anything longer. I think that's odd. Other scientists have put a mobile phone next to beehives for honeybees. Then the honeybees leave and they never come back. Further scientists have put mobile phones close to ants and in a restrained space, uh, if you put the mobile phone there, the ants will move their babies to the other end of the area and they will move the toilet up there. They will take their eating area and sleeping area and move it away from the radiation source. 
if you take it away, they will rearrange this area, moving the babies back, taking the toilet to where it was, and so on. So they're extremely sensitive to this. But honeybees and ants are not, not uh, the consumers. We are. And we cannot move away. We are constantly exposed. Also, when it comes to effects on the central nervous system, uh, scientists very early could show uh, that, for instance, rats show a retarded learning capacity, and it was through decreased short-term memory and decreased concentration capacity. If you visit a Swedish school nowadays, it's like the Second World War in the schoolroom. The children cannot concentrate and they cannot remember a lot of the things that the teachers say. Maybe this could play a role in it. And to make things worse, uh, scientists have studied boys uh, in a, a linguistic test. And when they were exposed to mobile phone radiation, they came out from the test less good. Their learning capacity was impaired. And I thought that all countries wanted to have the best students, the best pupils, so we can compete with each other. And some countries have looked very closely at this. For instance, the People's Republic of China. They keep their children away from radiation sources because they want to conquer the world. They want to be the biggest democracy, the richest country and so on. And the way to do it is to have the best educated population. But in Sweden we go in the other direction. We give children more and more and more of these gadgets at home, in school, and if you look on the uh, teaching and learning curve in Sweden, unfortunately, it's like the sperm count. It's like this. And it's a national crisis nowadays. Politicians are so stressed because Swedish pupils are falling behind so quickly. Another very interesting area of investigation was the idea that women may get breast cancer from the radiation from computers, mobile phones, wireless indoor phones, and so on. But no scientist could actually show that. But what was shown is that the electromagnetic fields reduce the efficacy of tamoxifen which is the primary drug to treat breast cancer. So you got a situation similar to tamoxifen resistance, meaning that the women died. Not from direct effects, but indirect effects. But no one has changed the treatment strategy I'm not aware of in Sweden, for instance, that any cancer doctors say that, hey, you cannot expose yourself when you take tamoxifen. You must stay away. I never hear that, but it's clear. And the interesting thing is that this journal, Bioelectromagnetics, is an industry-controlled journal, so, but still they had allowed the publication of this paper. We have written a number of other resolutions. As I said, being a Scandinavian, we constantly repeat ourselves. And we will probably have to repeat ourselves for many years to come. And one of these is called the London Resolution. It's from 2009. And again, a huge number of bullet points. And one thing we said was that we propose that children under 16 should use mobile phones and cordless phones for emergency calls only. No Wi-Fi, WiMAX, or other forms of wireless networking are placed in homes, schools, or public areas. Many of you may think that it's no idea. What's the idea to write and publish such things? 
society will never change. Uh, no one will listen. Uh, children and teenagers don't care, they just use all of it. But when I die, I want the last thought to be, I did my best, not I could have done better. One thing that we also decided to do, and that was after the industry had said, okay, the industry will come up with the new public exposure guidelines, and as you understand, they didn't do anything, then we said, we cannot let them just get away with this. We have to sit down, and so we did in Seletun, which is in Norway, and we did it in 2009, and the actual paper was published in 2010, and it's a very, very good and very important summary. If you don't want to read all the pages of the Bainishti report and so on, you can just read this paper. It's about 10 pages long, and it says, among many things, that low intensity, so-called non-thermal bioeffects and adverse health effects are demonstrated at levels significantly below existing standards. The public safety limits are inadequate and obsolete with respect to prolonged low intensity exposures and new biologically based public exposure standards are urgently needed to protect public health worldwide. And finally, it is not in the public interest to wait. That was the year 2010 and what has happened since then, uh, I will very shortly summarize all the things. But one very important issue for you is, and you know in English, Englishmen say, never trust a pretty face. You should not trust me. Uh, you should instead go to the literature. Today I have spent time on 10, 15 publications there are approximately 25,000 more for you to read. You have to read them, and you have to think and read and think, and finally come up with a decision for yourself and for your family. And if it goes to hell, don't blame me. I told you that you had to read for yourself. And I've told that to people around the world, including the Pope. I've told it to presidents, emperors, prime ministers, governments, parliaments, health authorities, and so on. And I constantly send uh, submissions to expert panels. The last two weeks, there's been a huge number of such expert panels in Canada. And we send the information and say, hey, there's a lot more out there. Please consider this. If not for yourself, at least for the future generations at least for children that are yet to be born. Think about them. And also, don't be so afraid. Uh, we are talking about toys. If all of these gadgets suddenly would disappear, nothing would change. You will still breathe, eat, go to the toilet, sleep, love, hate. Nothing will be altered. Life would continue. But the question is, what will happen when you 24-7, whole body irradiate everything on this planet at levels that are only to be understood in biblical terms? So what has happened 2011, 2012, and even to then 2013? I will just give you a few more examples. Uh, in May 6, 2011, the Council of Europe said that mobile phones and wireless networks must be banned in schools. Their Council of Europe committee examined evidence that the technologies have potentially harmful effects on humans and concluded that immediate action was required to protect children. Not tomorrow, but today, now we must do it. May 31st, 2011, then the World Health Organization, through its cancer organ called the International Association for Research on Cancer, 
classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic in class 2b. And then you have to remember that the World Health Organization has a class 4 for things that are proven safe. And you know when you buy a gadget like that, everyone says this is safe, this thing is safe, these, these, and so on, they're all safe. But the World Health Organization doesn't think so, because then it would have said class 4. And uh, you remember 10 years before that, 2001, power frequent magnetic fields were also cancer classified regarding childhood leukemia. And power frequent magnetic fields is the same as household electricity. October 12, 2012, the Italian Supreme Court ruled that mobile phones can cause cancer in a patient. And finally, now we're here in Barcelona, and maybe the answer to the question is no more full-scale experimentation. You know, now in Stockholm, it's very dark and it's very cold. You don't want to go there. But in the summertime, Stockholm is very nice. And a lot of tourists come to Stockholm. And there are tourists from all over the world. Americans, Japanese, Chinese, people from South America, Africa, from Germany, England, and so on. And when Swedes walk around in Stockholm, we see these groups with cameras and so on, you know. Sometimes we see groups of people that look very happy and they smile and laugh. And in Sweden, Swedes always then say, oh, they are from Spain. Thank you so much for having me here.